what we are going to do today is we are going to start a, or rather study a special topic myoglobin and hemoglobin. Since we studied about amino acids, their properties and proteins in general and enzymes, what we are going to do today is see how myoglobin and hemoglobin have an effect on the oxygen binding that is extremely important in our daily lives. So, if we go to the first slide here, what we have is the two proteins myoglobin and hemoglobin. Now, these proteins are involved in storage that is primarily myoglobin and transport primarily hemoglobin of oxygen. Now, we all know that we all breathe in oxygen and we exhale carbon dioxide and so on and so forth. But what we need to know is how this actually occurs. Okay? If we look at the partial pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs you see is the highest. The highest why? Because we know that we breathe in oxygen that goes to the lungs and it is passed through the capillaries through the active muscle where the oxygen is required for our activities. Okay? So, in the lungs we are going to have the largest partial pressure of oxygen followed by the capillaries followed by the active muscle. Now, the function of myoglobin and hemoglobin is actually to consider the transport of oxygen. Hemoglobin we will see how it transports oxy oxygen, how it binds oxygen and so the case with myoglobin. But myoglobin acts more like a storage protein and hemoglobin more like a transport protein based on their specific activities or specific modes of binding of oxygen. Now, the reason why we need the oxygen in the tissue obviously is for the oxidation of the fuels. What, is, what are the fuels? The food that we intake, right? When we study bioenergetics later on, we will see how actually we get the energy from the food. So, it is this breakdown of food that is going to provide us with energy and the oxygen in the tissue is required to drive this oxidation. We will also see that myoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin. So, it increases the transport and gives oxygen higher solubility in tissues because that is where the oxygen is needed for the energy, for the oxidation of the fuels and so on and so forth. So, this myoglobin we will see has higher affinity for oxygen than hemoglobin, but the lower affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen is required in the fact that it is going to transport the oxygen. We will see how that works. Now, each of these proteins have heme associated with it. Okay? We will see what heme is. It is a prosthetic group that is made of a hydrophobic porphyrin ring and the iron 2 plus that is part of what we call the iron in the blood. Okay? That is where it is in the heme. It is complexed in the porphyrin ring by two main chain histidine residues of the polypeptide chain. Okay? Now, what is this protoporphyrin 9? This is basically the structure of protoporphyrin 9 where what we have is we have a circular system. In this circular system, if you recognize these rings, these are actually pyrrole rings. Okay? The pyrrole rings are connected, you can see this network that is formed by the connection of the pyrrole rings which actually contribute the nitrogens here that coordinate the iron in the heme. Something wrong there? The organic portion of the heme molecule is therefore this. Something wrong? It is not coming there? 
So, when we are looking at this prosthetic group of myoglobin and hemoglobin, we have the organic portion of the heme molecule that is protoporphyrin 9, a circular system as you can see of covalently linked, what are these? Pyrrole groups. Okay, so, we have this, the, this is one pyrrole, this is another pyrrole, this is another pyrrole and so on and so forth. So, when we link these pyrrole groups together, we have these nitrogen atoms that actually coordinate the iron for the heme group. Is it is not there, just give, just tell me when it is not there, okay, so that I know. It is there now? They can do all the editing. Okay, so, what we have is if we look at this framework, if you look at this framework very carefully, you will see that there are three methyl groups. There is a CH3 here, there is a CH3 here and there is a CH3 here. Okay? So, there are three methyl groups, there are two vinyl groups. CH double bond CH2, CH double bond CH2 and there are two propionate groups CH2, CH2, CO minus, CH2, CH2, CO minus. So, this is what is the organic portion of the heme molecule. This is protoporphyrin 9. To make this heme, what you have to do is coordinate an iron in the center here. Okay? So, what we have is we have this circular system of covalently connected pyrrole groups that contribute the nitrogens for the binding of the iron that is going to give the heme that is the prosthetic group for myoglobin and hemoglobin. Okay? So, this is exactly what we have. So, this is our protoporphyrin structure that we saw in the previous slide and the heme differs from protoporphyrin 9 only in the coordination or the addition of the iron atom here. Okay? And the heme complex is inserted into the protein with the propionate groups that are these groups protruding into the solvent and the functioning portion of the heme is this tetra coordinated divalent Fe2 plus iron. Okay? And this is extremely important in the binding of oxygen that is required for the transport of oxygen and for the storage of oxygen and we will see how the heme, hemoglobin and myoglobin actually how the heme helps in doing this. If we look at myoglobin, you can see this is myoglobin. It has a single polypeptide chain, so it is a monomeric protein. It binds oxygen in a hyperbolic fashion, we will see what that means and each oxygen binds independently. Okay? So, what happens is you can see this one in red here is the heme. Okay? In the heme, you can see this yellow sphere that is the iron molecule, the iron that is attached to you can see actually linked to the histidine moieties again of the polypeptide chain. Okay? So, what we have in myoglobin is a single polypeptide chain, a single heme attached to it, so it will bind one oxygen molecule. Each heme binds an oxygen molecule and the fashion in which it binds is called a hyperbolic fashion, which we will see what it means in a minute and how it is important in the functioning of myoglobin. Okay? Because we have, we have to remember that the structure of myoglobin obviously is going to dictate its function. If we look at myoglobin, myoglobin is the first protein structure to be solved by X-ray crystallography by John Kendrew in 1959. This was followed by hemoglobin and then ribonuclease A. So, what we have in myoglobin, it is a single polypeptide chain and its role 
is oxygen transport into the muscle. It is needed because the muscle is going to use the oxygen much faster than the tissues or the lungs because the lungs is always getting a supply of oxygen, but the tissue is using up the oxygen. Okay? So, the myoglobin is present more in the tissues. Why? So, that it can provide the oxygen that is required for the oxygen. Now, what we have here is if we look at what I have got on the right hand side of this, this is the beta chain of hemoglobin, just the beta chain. You see how similar it is in structure to the myoglobin polypeptide chain. Okay? But the difference between myoglobin and hemoglobin is that myoglobin is a monomeric protein, whereas hemoglobin is a tetrameric protein. It has two alpha chains and it has two beta chains. Okay? It is a tetrameric protein, but if you look at the beta chain, it has a very similar structure to the myoglobin and this is the heme portion of the molecule. If we look at the red portion here, it is the heme and so is this the heme in hemoglobin. What does it mean? If this heme can bind one oxygen and hemoglobin has four such chains, what does this tell us about hemoglobin? That it can bind four oxygen molecules. Okay. So, what we have is we have the tetrameric protein hemoglobin. It has two alpha chains and two beta chains. Each of these have a heme associated with it. So, there are four polypeptide chains, two alpha and two beta in the quaternary structure. Each polypeptide has a heme and it can bind oxygen and we will see that the oxygen binding is a sigmoid fashion, is in a sigmoid fashion. We will see what that means. If you remember what we mentioned for myoglobin, it was in a hyperbolic fashion and this is in a sigmoidal fashion and each oxygen binds in a cooperative manner. This is what I mentioned in one of the earlier classes that if one now you recognize that these heme, these hemes are going to bind an oxygen each. As soon as one heme binds an oxygen, it facilitates the binding of the oxygen to the other hemes, which is what is meant by cooperativity. Okay? So, the affinity for oxygen increases for the other hemes as soon as one of the hemes binds the oxygen, which is why it is called that, it, which is why it is said that it binds in a cooperative fashion. Okay. In general now, if we look at protein ligand binding, we will see how we can extrapolate this or how we can see what it means in terms of myoglobin and hemoglobin. Now, usually what we mention here of the way it is represented is you represent it in the fraction or the percent of the protein that has the ligand bound to it. Okay? So, 100 percent would, would mean that if you had a large amount of ligand concentration, all the protein sites would be bound with the ligand. Now, what we have is this is what is meant by a hyperbolic curve. right? The general equation of this is y is equal to x by x plus z. Now, what is this y? The y is the fraction of the ligand bound. Okay? It is represented as theta also. The fraction of the ligand bound, x is the ligand concentration and z represents the dissociation constant. What is the dissociation constant? When we are considering a protein and ligand bound together, when it associates, we have an association constant and when it dissociates, we have a corresponding dissociation constant, which is what? What is the dissociation constant? It is just the inverse of the association constant. Now, when we are looking at this hyperbolic curve, 
you recognize that when I have 50 percent saturation as it is called because if I have enough ligand concentration and all my protein sites are bound, I have a saturated situation, right. Now, when I reach 50 percent saturation here, it means that my y or the fraction of ligand bound is half 50 percent. Now, that 50 percent corresponds on the x axis to the dissociation constant because of the ligand concentration associated with it. Why? Because we have a hyperbolic equation corresponding to y is equal to x by x plus z, where x is our ligand concentration and z is the dissociation constant. So, what are we saying? We have extrapolation to the x axis from the point on this hyperbolic curve that corresponds to a fractional occupancy of 0.5 or 50 percent saturation means that that corresponding whatever we have corresponding on the x axis is the dissociation constant, fine. Now, we are going to see how we can utilize this for the binding of oxygen not only to myoglobin, but also to hemoglobin which actually behaves a bit differently. So, if we go to protein ligand binding in general, we will study this in more detail later on. What we are talking about is we are talking about a fraction that is occupied. What is occupied? The protein sites are bound with oxygen. So, we have a concentration of oxygen in the peripheral tissues. What do you expect the oxygen concentration to be in the tissues? Less than that is there in the lungs right. When we are looking at the oxygen concentration in the tissues, it is less than that is there in the lungs. What does that mean? It means that the ligand concentration in the lungs is higher, right. If the ligand concentration is higher in the lungs, what do you expect in the lungs? You expect 100 percent saturation, right. But when we the ligand concentration is low. Where is the oxygen concentration low? In the tissues, okay. So, we will not even have 50 percent saturation then, but as we increase the amount of oxygen, this is why measured in terms of the partial pressure of oxygen. As you increase the partial pressure of oxygen, when you reach the lungs, you will have 100 percent saturation. Now, the way this is measured is we measure something called P 50. P 50 is the partial pressure of oxygen where 50 percent of the heme sites are filled. What does that mean? That means in myoglobin you have just one heme site, right. So, that basically is it is either filled or it is unfilled, but for hemoglobin what can you have? You can have 1, you can have 2, you can have 3 or you can have 4, but usually what happens it is either an all or none situation because as soon as one of the oxygen molecules binds to one heme, what does it do? It behaves in a cooperative fashion and it helps the binding of the other oxygen atoms also. So, the other oxygen atoms bind very quickly. So, what do we have? The concentration of oxygen in the tissues is a small fraction of that in the lungs that we understand. Now, when oxygen laden hemoglobin reaches the peripheral tissues, the partial pressure of oxygen falls. So, what happens is the saturation is less. So, hemoglobin will release the oxygen, right. So, what is happening is when in the situation where the partial pressure of oxygen is high in the lungs, hemoglobin will take up the oxygen. When it is, since it is circulating in the blood, what is happening? When it is coming to a point near the tissues, the pressure of oxygen, the partial pressure of oxygen is low. So, what is happening to it? It is releasing it, 
there is a dissociation. You have to remember that there is an equilibrium. The HB plus O2 giving you as we call HBO2 is an equilibrium situation. So, at one time you are shifting it to the left of the equilibrium, at one time you are shifting it to the right of the equilibrium. Now, when is it going to go to the right? It is going to go to the right when the ligand concentration or the oxygen concentration is high like it is in the lungs. Okay? Okay. Now, suppose we have, now I want you to understand this very, very clearly. Suppose we have a situation where I have an oxygen transport protein. Okay? Now, if you look at the curve on top that is in purple here or the darker curve, this is the curve for myoglobin that binds oxygen in a hyperbolic fashion. What we have on the y axis is the fraction and what we have on the x axis is the partial pressure of oxygen. Now, the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs is high. The partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is low. If my, this is the hyperbolic curve for myoglobin, okay. What we have in the blue curve here is a strong binding. Why do I say a strong binding? If you have an hyperbolic curve, it means that even at a low pressure of oxygen, you have reached 80 percent saturation. Is that clear? When you have a low pressure of oxygen, let me draw it here. When we have a low pressure of oxygen, what are we looking at? We are looking at a fraction or a saturation. Here what are we looking at? What is the x axis? The partial pressure of oxygen. What we are saying is we are looking at the curve for myoglobin now. Myoglobin behaves in a hyperbolic fashion. So, this is the situation in lungs, this is the situation in tissues. So, what can we say? We can say that even when the partial pressure is low, myoglobin will not easily dissociate the oxygen from the heme. Is that clear? So, what are we saying? We are saying that the partial pressure of oxygen in the lungs is high, the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues is low and if we have the binding in a hyperbolic fashion, what are, this is 100 percent saturation. So, we have a fraction here of 1, this is say 0.8. What am I saying? I am still 80 percent saturated with the oxygen even at the tissues. Okay? And that is what I want. But if we go back to the slides here, then if we look at now the myoglobin curve, what is there in the myoglobin curve? Even at the concentration or the partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues, myoglobin still is more than 80 percent saturated. Right? But if you want a transport protein, what, the, what is the transportation supposed to do? It is supposed to take in the oxygen and release it. Is that clear? The hemoglobin has to release the oxygen. If it does not release the oxygen, it is no point in binding it. So, if we have a strong binding transport protein, what is going to happen? It is going to be efficient in binding, but inefficient in unloading. Is that clear? 
because hemoglobin has to release the oxygen. If it does not release the oxygen, it makes no sense for it to bind it. Okay? So, what we have here is if we have a strong binding transport protein, it is very efficient in its binding. It is still 80 percent saturated at the lower concentration in the tissues, but the tissues need the oxygen. And if the, if the oxygen is still bound, then it is no point. It has to be released. Okay. So, what happens if let us say we have something like this. If we have a weak binding transport protein, myoglobin remains as it is in a hyperbolic fashion. So, it has, it is more than 80 percent saturated in the lungs as well as in the tissues. But if we have a weak binding transport protein, what is going to happen to this? It is going to be efficient in releasing the oxygen, right? Because at the pressure of partial pressure of oxygen in the tissues, it is low, the saturation is low, so it will release the oxygen, but it is not very efficient in the binding, right? It is pretty inefficient because even when I am close to 100 millimeter mercury, I still do not have even 70 percent oxygen bound, right? So, in this case, I have something that is efficient in the unloading, but inefficient in the binding, right? So, in this case, I have a weak binding transport protein. In the previous case, we had a strong binding transport protein but none of this is helping me. Why? Because in the lungs I have to have what? I have to have strong binding and in the tissues I have to have it released. Okay? So, I sort of have to have a combination of methods where it will be what? It will be efficient in binding and also efficient in the unloading. Right? So, we have to have a transport protein that is going to behave like this. How is it going to behave? It is going to be highly saturated in the lungs and it is going to be efficient in the unloading of the protein, uh, unloading of the oxygen in the tissues. So, what do we have? What is this then curve depicting? What is this curve depicting? It is telling you that you have something that is efficient in binding and also efficient in unloading. This is the sigmoidal curve of hemoglobin. So, what does hemoglobin do? It is very efficient in taking up the oxygen in the lungs and it is also efficient in unloading the oxygen in the tissues, which is what you want. Okay? So, this is what would be the required binding curve for a protein that would transport oxygen, but for myoglobin, it is a storage protein. If myoglobin were also like this, then what would happen in the tissues? All the oxygen will be lost. Okay? But myoglobin is highly saturated even at the low partial pressure at the tissue level, okay? which is essential because it is a storage protein. Now, so what do we have here? We have a transition from a weak binding state to a strong binding state. So, this is the curve for hemoglobin, which is what is called in a sigmoid fashion. The rise is in a sigmoid fashion where we have high affinity at high oxygen partial pressure, which means we have affected binding. When we are at this stage, we have low affinity at low oxygen levels, which means it is effective in unloading the protein, unloading the oxygen. Okay? So, that is the optimum that the hemoglobin can do. Okay? It will bind it strongly, it will release it also strongly depending on what? Depending on the partial pressure of the oxygen. 
So, you would have it bind in a sigmoid fashion. It would have high affinity at high oxygen. Why? Because you want effect efficient binding, effective loading. It would have low affinity at low oxygen. So, you would have effective unloading of the oxygen. Okay. So, this is what we have. Saturation, the partial pressure of oxygen. This is the myoglobin curve for oxygen binding that is a hyperbolic curve. This is a sigmoidal curve for hemoglobin and you understand why it has to be a sigmoidal curve and why this has to be a hyperbolic curve. Okay. So, the functions of myoglobin and hemoglobin are to bind oxygen when its concentration or partial pressure is relatively high and release it when it is required. Okay. It cannot just keep on binding tightly to it because otherwise you would not get the oxygen where you need it. Okay. So, where the partial pressure is low, it is going to release it. So, when you are in dire need of oxygen, you come to this, then myoglobin which is the transport protein or which rather which is the storage protein will release the oxygen at that point only. So, you are panting for breath, you have run up the stairs because you are late for class. Okay. Then your myoglobin, your tissues lack the oxygen, the myoglobin will come to the rescue and because your pressure has gone down, it will give the oxygen that is required. Okay. So, this is why the curves are shaped like this and you have to understand why hemoglobin has to be the sigmoidal fashion, uh, bind in a sigmoidal fashion and myoglobin in a hyperbolic fashion. Okay. So, what do we have? We have the fraction of sites, a hyperbolic curve and we have a low P50. What is this P50? The P50 is a partial pressure at which is 50 percent saturated. If you have a low P50, it means you are half saturated at a low pressure. So, you have a low concentration of the ligand and you are already highly saturated. What does it mean? It means you have a high affinity. You have a high affinity if at a low concentration you are 50 percent saturated. Right? So, we have this oxygen binding curve for myoglobin. If we look at hemoglobin, we have hemoglobin bind oxygen reversibly. Okay? These are the features of the transport protein hemoglobin. What are they? It binds oxygen reversibly. You know carbon monoxide is a poison. Why is that? Carbon monoxide binds more strongly to heme than does oxygen, which is why it is highly toxic. It will not release the carbon monoxide okay, very easily. So, it is highly toxic. Now, hemoglobin has two states, oxyhemoglobin as the name implies where we have four of the oxygen bound. Why do we have four? Because we have four subunits each subunit has a heme, each heme is going to bind an oxygen. We also have deoxyhemoglobin where no oxygen is bound and usually as I said it is either fully loaded or fully unloaded. So, we either have oxyhemoglobin or deoxyhemoglobin and the binding is in a cooperative fashion. It is something that I mentioned last time what is called an allosteric effect where the uptake of one ligand that is one oxygen molecule is going to influence the affinity for the binding of the other oxygen molecules. So, it is going to help or facilitate the binding of the other oxygen molecules. So, what we have is a reversible binding of oxygen to give four oxygen bound in what is called oxyhemoglobin. No oxygen bound is deoxyhemoglobin. So, we would have deoxyhemoglobin at a low pressure of oxygen. We would have oxyhemoglobin at a high partial pressure of oxygen. And we have all or none situation where it is either oxy or deoxy and it exhibits cooperative binding. So, this is our the P50 for hemoglobin is low, low affinity. At low pressure, it has low affinity. At high pressure, it has high affinity. 
which is why it is this sigmoidal curve. Myoglobin has a higher P50. Why? Because it, it reaches 50 percent saturation faster at a lower concentration of oxygen. So, what do we have? We have strong binding here for the hemoglobin where 4 oxygen molecules are bound and we have weak bind binding here where nothing is actually bound yet and we gradually reach this uh, saturation. Okay? So, we have the cooperative binding which is why actually this is sigmoidal because you have cooperative binding this is sigmoidal and this is a hyperbolic fashion for myoglobin. Okay. Now, we have to come to some expressions. If we have reversible binding, okay, that means we have MB myoglobin plus oxygen in a reversible because we know we have to release the oxygen when we need it giving you MbO2. What is this Kd? It is the dissociation constant. So, if I wrote it this way, I would have an association constant because I am associating the oxygen with the myoglobin and the inverse of this is the dissociation constant. What do I have? I have MbO2, the concentration of myoglobin, concentration of oxygen and the concentration of the MbO2 and where is the oxygen binding? It is binding to the heme of the myoglobin. why do not you work out a fractional saturation? Okay? Suppose you want to know the fractional saturation, say y. What is y? y is going to be equal to MbO2 divided by Mb plus MbO2, right? Because MbO2 is what? What is bound? And the total amount is the free MB that has not bound plus the MbO2. So, if we rearrange this, we can express it in terms of the oxygen concentration just by some algebra. Okay? So, what do we have? We can get the partial pressure PO2 in terms of Y when you know what the K is and you know what the PO2 is. At 50 percent saturation, what do you have? This is just like the hyperbolic fashion curve that I showed you for protein ligand binding in the beginning, where you have what? Y is equal to X divided by X plus Z. Okay? So, when you have this PO2, now we know what the partial pressure of oxygen is. If we have this equal to K, then obviously we have 50 percent saturation. Okay? So, the 50 percent saturation that is P50 is defined when we have Y equal to 0 0.5 and that is possible when K is equal to PO2 okay? in the expression here. So, what do we have? We have a specific dissociation constant that we have this defined and we have a fractional saturation that has been defined and we know that this fractional saturation would be 50 percent when the K value is equal to the PO2. Now, this is what is called a Hill equation. Okay? What we have here is if we look, look at the expression, we have a log Y. What is Y? Y is the fraction of the enzyme with substrate bound to it divided by 1 minus y. It is log y divided by 1 minus y is equal to h. We will see what this h means log s. What is s? s is the substrate concentration which in this case is going to be 
oxygen minus log k d. Actually, you can work it out from the previous expression that we had for the y. Okay, you can try and work that out. It is just the previous expression worked out and written in this fashion that has a specific name to it called the Hill equation. In the expression what we have, we have y by y 1 minus y which is the fraction of binding sites which are occupied. The k d is the dissociation constant and h is a factor that actually gives us some information about the type of binding. Okay? If this h is equal to 1, it means that there is no cooperativity. What does cooperativity mean? It means that the binding of one ligand molecule, one substrate molecule is going to activate the binding of the other ligand molecules. If there is no such cooperativity, say hemoglobin was non-cooperative, what it would mean? That if one heme bound the oxygen, it did not matter to the other subunits. We have three cases here, H can be 1, H can be N. What is N? N is the number of sites that you have. Okay? So, what is N for myoglobin? 1. What is N for hemoglobin? 4. Okay. Now, when H is equal to 1, then the enzyme exhi exhibits no cooperativity. If H is equal to N, then you have perfect cooperative behavior. Usually, this does not occur. And if you have something, a number between 1 and N, then you have a certain degree of cooperativity. What does that mean? It means that you can have a value in between the total number of sites that are available and 1. What does this cooperative, cooperativity mean? It means that you can have the ligand bound to one of the heme of one of the subunits that will affect, facilitate the binding to the others. And then you can plot what is called a hill plot where can you tell me what you are going to plot? You are going to plot log y by 1 minus y on the y axis versus log s and the slope is going to tell you, this is also called the hill coefficient, it is going to tell you what the hill coefficient is. Okay? So, what do we expect the hill coefficient for myoglobin to be? 1. Because there it is equal to n, there is only one site. But for hemoglobin, we expect it to be less than 4. Why? Because there is cooperativity. Okay? So, that is exactly what happens. This is what we have. What is our measure for S? Substrate concentration is measured by the partial pressure of oxygen in this case. So, when we have log Y by 1 minus Y, what do we get? For myoglobin, we get N equal to 1. And for hemoglobin, we get n equal to 2.8. Okay? This is what is the Hill plot and these values are called the Hill coefficients. Okay? So, actually what is happening to hemoglobin? What is happening to hemoglobin at low partial pressure of oxygen? At low partial pressure of oxygen, it is, by, it is bound weakly. Right? And at high partial pressure of oxygen, it is bound strongly. Okay? So, actually this is a mixture of two curves, a weak binding curve and a strong binding curve. Okay? That is what we have on the next slide. Okay. Try and understand this. What we are looking at is, we are looking at a hill plot. What do we have on the y axis? Log y by 1 minus y versus log P O 2 which is basically log S. Fine? Now, when the pressure of oxygen is low, then there is no 
cooperativity yet. Why? Because a ligand molecule has not attached to it, the heme yet. You get the cooperativity after the ligand has attached to the heme, right? As soon as one ligand attaches to the heme, when is that going to happen? That is going to happen at the specific pressure. So when you reach that pressure, then what is going to happen? If we reach this pressure, then say at this point here, what do we have at this point? At this point, we have the NH that is the Hill coefficient equal to 1 because the ligand molecule has not yet bound to the heme. As soon as one of them gets bound to the heme, so now we have one of the oxygen molecules bound to one of the hemes in one of the subunits, it is going to start or facilitate the binding of the other oxygens. So what you are going to ha have is you are going to have a sharp increase what? Where? In the saturation. Because of the sigmoidal fashion of the curve, you are going to get a sharp increase in the saturation. As you increase the pressure beyond the definite level, why? Because you have the cooperativity. Because as soon as one of them binds, it is going to help bind the other ones, right? And then you come to this level where again when you have reached the high affinity state, there is nothing more that can be bound to it, okay? It is reached the high saturation level, okay? So it is this point when this slope that we will consider for the Hill equation that is going to give us a value close to 3. And for the heme myoglobin, we are going to get a value of 1. Okay? So this explains the Hill plot for hemoglobin and myoglobin. Okay? What are we going to get? We get a Hill coefficient of myoglobin that corresponds to 1, a Hill coefficient of hemoglobin that corresponds to 3. Okay. Now, there is another thing that we just need to understand, something called the Bohr effect. What is this Bohr effect? We are not going into going into the details of all this, but what is happening is the hemoglobin has bound the oxygen to it, right? Where is it binding the oxygen to it? In the lungs, right? Now, when it comes to a lower partial pressure of oxygen, what is it going to do? It is going to release the oxygen, right? Now, as it, where is it, it going to do this? In the tissues, right? So, there is basically an exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide and protons. Okay? So, essentially what is going to happen now is you are going to release the oxygen and it is going to become deoxyhemoglobin, but it is going to be associated with the carbon dioxide and the H plus. Eventually, actually what is going to happen is what is going to happen to the pH? What is going to happen to the pH then? If I have an increased amount of H plus, it is going to decrease. Okay? So the binding curve is going to change with the change in the pH, right? And how should it change? It should change in such a fashion that the oxygen is released at the tissue level. So, what do we have? This is what we have. At a higher pH, we have the peripheral tissues here. The pH is 7.6. As we have the carbon dioxide release, the H plus what is happening? This lowers the pH. As it lowers the pH, what is going to happen to the? So, say, suppose the par, you are at a specific partial pressure of oxygen here. At the PO2 says 20. What is going to happen when the pH is lowered? 
the oxygen is going to release. Why? Because the saturating is, saturation is going to be less. If there is a decrease in the saturation, because of the decrease in the pH, what does that mean? Oxygen is going to be released. And where is this going to occur? In the tissues. Okay? So, in the tissues, you are going to have the metabolism that is going to create carbon dioxide, lower the pH, reduced pH is going to promote oxygen release. Because the affinity for the oxygen of hemoglobin is less, the saturation is less at a lower pH. If the saturation is less at a lower pH, it means oxygen is going to be lost and that is exactly what you wanted to do. You wanted to supply the oxygen at the tissue level so that you can have the oxygen released. Okay? So, this is exactly what happens. This is an one interesting thing that we might consider. This is called BPG. Okay? This is just for an interesting application of what the body actually can do. This BPG is bisphosphoglycerate. It is synthesized by the red blood cells and it binds not to hemoglobin, not to oxyhemoglobin, but binds very tightly to deoxyhemoglobin. What is deoxyhemoglobin? When the hemoglobin does not have oxygen bound to it, it is called deoxyhemoglobin. This BPG binds to deoxyhemoglobin and what happens is the cavity that is present in deoxyhemoglobin is large enough to hold the BPG molecule in there. Okay? Now, once it holds the BPG molecule, then can you tell me what is going to happen to the oxygen then? If the deoxy is binding the BPG, then the oxygen will not be bound to it, it will be released. Okay? Where can this be useful? Where? Where can it be useful? Where there is less oxygen? No, where there is less oxygen available. Suppose you are climbing a mountain, there is less oxygen available, BPG is produced in the red blood cells more. So that it binds to the deoxy and you do not need as much oxygen as you would require. Okay? So, that is exactly what happens. It is useful because it can be adjusted more rapidly than Hb level. So, instead of adjusting the hemoglobin level, what you adjust is the BPG level. That is what the body does for you. Okay? So, when you have high altitude, it adapts so that it can unload more oxygen to the capillaries where you need, but it will not require the hemoglobin to bind the oxygen because the deoxy has already bound the BPG. Okay? So, we will stop here today. Thank you. compounds that have a polar head group and a hydrophobic tail. Now, we are going to understand how these are organized into membranes and what their functions are. So, basically what we have anything that is nonpolar hydrophobic compound soluble in organic solvents is called a lipid. Now, the membrane lipids that we talk about are what are called amphipathic in nature. What do we mean by amphipathic? It means that it has a nonpolar end and a polar end to it. Now, the nonpolar end arises due to definite chemical moieties, definite groups, and the polar end again arises due to some other groups that are present. Now, if we look at the functions of lipids, they play a very important role in cells and biological cell membranes and of course, membrane transport which we will be doing later on. We have steroid hormones in digestion as fats and triacylglycerols which give us the fuel for our bodies and the membrane structure. 
So, lipids are involved in all of these activities starting from hormones to digestion elements that are present in the bile, these are all lipid have lipids as their components. The fats and triacylglycerols are lipids and in membrane structures which will what, what we will be doing today, we have fatty acids, phospholipids, sphingolipids and cholesterol. Now, initially what we are going to do is we are going to study what the different nomenclature and the different types of fatty acids. Now, what we mean by a fatty acid is a long chain acid. Now, in the organic carboxylic group that we speak about, we speak of a C double bond O, OH being the acid moiety. So, what happens? So, we have our glycerol. It is in this case, the one that I show you here is triacyl glycerol, which is what comprises the fat droplets that we have in cells. If you see, there are triacyl or triglyceride tests that have to be performed in blood to see whether you have an appropriate triglyceride content. If you have more fat droplets, then you have a fat restricted diet. Okay. So, this is what a triacyl glycerol would look like. What do we have here? Here is the structure of glycerol. We have three OH groups here. If each of them number 1, number 2 and number 3 are each esterified, this is what it is going to look like. So, in the first carbon atom and in the third carbon atom, we have straight chain fatty acids that have been that have been used to esterify the OH groups of the glycerol. The extreme OH groups of the glycerol have been esterified with straight chain fatty acids here. In the middle, we straight away know that this has now not only one, but it has two cis double bonds, which is why it is even bent further than the one I showed you previously. Okay. If you look at the structure here, this is linoleic acid that has been used. We have one cis bond here and another cis bond here. So, it has changed the structure of the hydrocarbon chain into making it more disrupted. It is more kinked in a sense. Now, we are going to see how we can change the properties of the groups here 